and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, Pinterest and Zoom make their public debuts. Will investors hit the brakes after Lyft's slow start or move full speed ahead? We'll speak to the CEOs of both companies. Plus, a global legal battle that has dragged on for years is over. And Apple and Qualcomm have settled their differences, at least for the next six years. And Netflix gives an underwhelming forecast in its earnings results, but CEO Reed Hastings says he's confident new services from Disney and Apple won't slow their momentum. But first to our lead, Pinterest is joining a slew of unicorns heading to the public market this year. Unlike some of the other big names making their trading debut, Pinterest is burning less cash. The social media discovery company has taken a slow and steady approach to growth compared to its peers. I spoke with Ben Silberman, CEO of Pinterest, after the company listed its shares on the New York Stock Exchange. We really talked with investors about how regular people use the product every day. Uh, people use it to get inspiration uh, for a whole range of things, everything from the food they cook to the clothes they wear uh, to their homes. Um, and it's really more about your personal inspiration. It's less about your friends. Uh, it's not really about following celebrities in the news. Um, we wanted to make sure that everyone understood that because that's how our users uh, see the product every day. So you launched Pinterest nine years ago, and many companies have gone public much more quickly with much deeper losses. Why did you feel that now was the right time? Uh, you know, we're really proud of the progress we made over the last few years uh, to build out the business. We felt like we were at a point uh, where the business had reached a level of predictability, that it could be in the public markets. We were also excited at having the opportunity to have access to public market capital. Uh, and the reason is that a lot of great companies have acquired uh, other companies in the future. We thought this would enable us to do it. You know, finally, we just had a lot of patient investors and employees, so it's a nice moment to provide some liquidity for both of those parties. Patience is a virtue. Um, some investors might look at Pinterest and say, you're just another digital marketing company. So what do you think makes your advertising model unique to other platforms? You know, I think the thing that makes it really special is that the reason people are on Pinterest, which is to get inspiration and do things with their life, it's really lined up with what advertisers want, which is to inspire new customers and get them to buy products and services they really love. What that means is that the ads on Pinterest can actually be really additive as long as we do a good job of making sure they're highly relevant. And I think that's just really different from a lot of media companies where ads are candidly a little bit of a tax. Um, that difference in alignment, I think, is the biggest difference between us uh, and some other media properties. Now, one of the primary criticisms is that the majority of user growth right now is coming internationally, and that is where average revenue per user is lower than in the United States. How much room to run is there in the U.S. in terms of growing users, or is it more of a story about increasing engagement? You know, I still think there's a real opportunity to grow over time and to increase engagement. You know, a lot of people might use Pinterest for one thing or two things, but they don't know the wide range of different ways uh, people all over the world use the product. I also got to say that we're super proud that we're growing globally. You know, if it was just a few years ago, uh, the story would have been primarily a U.S.-based service. And so it's just really fulfilling for the company to know that the product works all over the world. So what is the plan to grow international sales? You know, we're actually just in the very first chapter of that story. So we're just hiring, you know, our first local sales teams in places like Canada, uh, Western Europe, Germany, and France. So we're just at the beginning of the journey, um, but I think there's going to be a real opportunity uh, to show the same great results we've seen in the United States uh, to advertisers uh, all over the world. So do you see profits coming soon, and if so, when? Or is your focus going to be more on investing to grow the top line? You know, we're going to continue to invest for the long term. You know, we've shown really good margin improvement over the last few years, but my eye is always on what's going to make Pinterest great three years, five years, ten years from now. And so that's going to be how we continue to run the business. Uh, and we're really excited to, to see it keep growing. Now, Pinterest is great, Ben, at collecting dreams, but less so on executing them. What do you plan to do to better connect those two things? 
you know, we're always working to make sure people can bridge that gap between seeing something inspiring and doing it. Uh, one area that we're investing in is making sure that we match inspirational images uh, with more and more products that are at a price point that matters for people and for retailers they really trust. So we just enable people who are retailers to upload all of their catalogs into Pinterest. We're investing a lot into computer vision technology to match those products with images. And we're not just doing it with shopping, we're also doing it with all the different use cases. So if you have a recipe on Pinterest, now you'll see the ingredients, uh, people can write reviews. If you have a DIY project, uh, you can see other people's experiences, whether it was easy or whether it was a little harder than they expected. Now, you played around with buyable pins back in the day. Those didn't really take off. Do you really think that social commerce will be a thing someday? You know, I don't know about social commerce overall, but I definitely know that our users often want to buy the things they find on Pinterest. A lot of people say they discovered a product or service while browsing Pinterest. We just want to make it easier for them to go from that inspiration um, all the way to reality, which in this case would be a purchase. That was Ben Silverman, CEO of Pinterest. And Pinterest wasn't the only tech company to go public this week. Zoom Video, a San Jose-based provider of video conferencing services, also went public on the NASDAQ. I spoke with CEO Eric Yuan soon after shares started trading. Yesterday, we finalized the price of $36. You know, today, wow, there's a big pump. So, and uh, you know, it's, it, it is out of our control. You know, we just go back to work. So... <laughs> Well, so how do you live up to it now? <laughs> I think, first of all, I would say the market opportunity is huge, right? Over $40 billion of market opportunity. And uh, the customer, they, they do trust us. And our employees so far is also very excited, very happy. As long as we stay humble, continue working as hard as we can to keep delivering happiness to our customers, I think it will be okay in the long run. Now, uh, many people have talked about how Zoom is a rare unicorn in that you are profitable. Should we expect you to grow profits this year or focus on investing to improve top line growth? I think we should focus on the boats and we want to grow for sure. That's our top, top of our priority. But at the same time, we also want to have a much more disciplined approach, right? And we want to have a right balance. And uh, I think we should focus on growth at the same time, also focus on the cash flow positive. So you were last on our show to talk about your immigration struggles. The U.S. government had denied your visa eight times before <laughs> they finally approved it. Now you're taking a, a, public, a company public on a major U.S. exchange. What does that mean to you? I first of all, I appreciate the visa officer finally giving me approval to come here, to come to Silicon Valley. I think one thing I learned is never give up. You know, keep trying, keep trying, and keep working hard, and never give up. You know, have a dream, and someday your dream will come true. You know, today is, uh, you know, our dream coming true, right? To be a public national company. I think many years of hard work, you know, is well, well paid off. Now, Cisco has begun to offer some of the features that you offer. Cisco, of course, is your former employer. How do you see competition from Cisco evolving? Yeah, Cisco is a great company. I was there for four and a half years. I learned a lot and I really appreciate, you know, all the support when I was there. And we do not look at the competitors. You know, we always uh, spend the time on talking to our customers. We try to be the first vendor to really understand the customer's problems and then work very hard to come up, with a, come up with a much better solution to serve our customer well. This market opportunity is huge, right? As long as we care about our customers, we'll be okay. We do not specifically focus on our competitors. And what about Google? Why should customers use your products rather than Google if they're already, let's say, using Google's cloud products? So I'm using Google product, product as well. I, I'm using Gmail, I'm using Google Calendar, I'm using YouTube, and Google is great on many fronts, right? Like a search, you know, YouTube, and you know, Google, the mobile phone. But when it comes to cloud, uh, video uh, conferencing, the cloud-based uh, cloud video conferencing, I think we just spend more time on that. You know, we really you know, care about our customer more than any other vendors. That's why customer likes our solution. The feedback is Zoom just works anywhere, any device. I think we spend more time, we allocate more resources on that than any of other competitors. 
Now, do you see taking more market share away from competitors, or do you actually see growth, meaningful growth, in the video conferencing space? Yeah, that's a great question. So recently, we announced a Zoom marketplace. We built up a platform. For now, you know, we can allow all the third-party partners, developers, to build all kinds of third-party applications. Because video conferencing is a brand new market. It opens up so many new use cases. We never thought about that. I think a huge opportunity, like a telemedicine application, you know, online uh, learning application, a huge opportunity, I think. Now, what are the opportunities you see beyond video conferencing? I think, uh, you know, the video is a new voice, right? You look at the traditional, you know, the on-prem, you know, the PBX system. I think in the next several years, they are all going to migrate to the cloud-based solution. I think uh, this is not an opportunity, you know, and because uh, video, the real voice is a part of the video. I think there's another uh, growth opportunity. Now, Zoom is more exposed to the Chinese market than some other U.S. tech companies. What have you learned uh, from navigating the Chinese market, and how f much more growth do you think you'll see there? I think look at the China market for now is uh, I do not think there there are so many very successful like a, a software as a service company. I think in the future, you know, we, we might have f focus on that market. For now, we are already very busy focus on North American uh, North American market, the Japan, Australia, and Europe, right? And uh, you know, focus on the the business productivity. And in the future, probably we are going to focus on uh, market in India and China. For now, that's not our top priority. That was Zoom CEO Eric Yuan. Well, soon after a devastating fire engulfed Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris on Monday, news outlets began streaming live broadcasts on YouTube. That led to several clips, including a box of text. The company introduced the text box feature last year to combat the spread of conspiracy theories, including those that question the 9-11 attacks. But YouTube software mistakenly labeled the plumes of smoke in Paris as footage from 2001, triggering the panel below the video. In a statement, a YouTube spokesperson said these panels are triggered algorithmically and our systems sometimes make the wrong call. We are disabling these panels for live streams related to the fire. Coming up, after years of battling it out, Qualcomm signs a deal for royalties and chips with Apple to end a global legal dispute. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Well, Elon Musk has already been warned about his Twitter use, but that hasn't stopped him so far. Musk tweeted another Tesla production forecast, like the one that got him in trouble in the first place. He wrote that the company will build over half a million cars in the next year. A similar tweet led the SEC to argue he was in contempt of a settlement reached last year. Joining us to discuss, Bloomberg Craig Trudell, who covers Tesla for us. So, uh, Craig, what exactly happened this time? So this is, uh, as you pointed out, very similar to a post that he sent in February. Uh, in, in that post, he said that uh, the company was going to build uh, about 500,000 cars this year. Uh, around that time, uh, the in-house securities lawyer at uh, Tesla, who uh, was, was sort of named to a position or hired as a result of a settlement with the SEC, uh, reached out to, to Musk and sort of worked with him to quickly uh, send out a, a, a follow-up tweet to sort of clean that first one up because it was uh, sort of inconsistent with uh, past statements. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a sort of deeper story there where Musk himself sort of contradicted uh, a, a written statement on an earnings call. But in any case, uh, they tried to clean it up. The SEC very much took notice and uh, reached out to uh, Musk's lawyers. And we found ourselves in this uh, contempt of court fight. Uh, for, for Musk to send this tweet over the weekend, it was very reminiscent of it. It also just, uh, based on sort of context clues, didn't look like the sort of post that maybe was uh, run by a lawyer. It was sort of in passing and made in a reply to uh, some, some person on, on Twitter. Uh, so it, it, it definitely sort of read as though uh, Musk was doing something very similar, just sort of casually talking about how many cars Tesla is going to make. And the SEC has argued that's very much material information and something that he's supposed to get cleared with, uh, with a lawyer within Tesla. 
So, Craig, there's no question that Elon Musk likes to fly close to the sun, which is what many investors love about him. But technically, if the information is correct, is he allowed, per this agreement, to tweet about it? Well, this is part of uh, why the, the judge uh, who's overseeing this case uh, told both sides uh, just within the last couple weeks uh, to put their reasonableness pants on, and that was those were her words, uh, to uh, go back and revisit this agreement and sort of come to an, an agreement of, uh, of what is and isn't material and what the sort of protocols are for Musk. Clearly, he, he does not like this agreement. Uh, he's wanted it changed. I think that's sort of come through in the, the ways in which uh, he and his legal team have sort of uh, reacted to the SEC, um, sort of, uh, you know, wanting to do battle over this again. Expedia Group is moving to simplify its ownership model and boost its value. The online travel company has agreed to acquire Liberty Expedia Holdings in a $2.6 billion all-stock deal. Expedia's super-voting stock structure has been divided between two billionaires, Barry Diller and Liberty's John Malone. Diller will become the largest shareholder with a 29% stake. Apple and Qualcomm agree to end a two-year legal battle over billions of dollars of tech licensing fees that threaten to jeopardize Qualcomm's most profitable line of business. Shares of the chipmakers surged more than 20 percent on the news Tuesday. To discuss details of the settlement, we spoke to Bloomberg's Ian King in San Francisco and our own Mark Gurman, who joined from outside the courthouse in San Diego. We were in round three of opening statements. This morning kicked off with Apple's lawyers giving their perspective. Then you had the contract manufacturers, which basically is the consortium of Foxconn, Pegatron, and others. And then after them, you had Qualcomm taking the stand. Now, we were about 10 minutes away of Qualcomm finishing their prepared opening remarks. Then the news came in from Apple about, about the settlement. And it was interesting because the lawyers kept going. It didn't seem like the lawyers were aware of what had been happening outside the courtroom. So, Ian, you were just on the show yesterday previewing what was going to happen. Jury selection was underway. You've been covering the chip industry for two decades. Are you surprised that oh. they came to terms here after all this bitterness? Well, you remember what we said yesterday, right? We, you, you showed that clip of your interview with Milenkov where he said, look, this is business. This will work itself out. And I said, well, we've, we've seen this kind of bitterness transform in a second to a collaborative relationship that appears to be what we have here. So Apple and Qualcomm released a joint statement saying that they, Apple, will be paying Qualcomm a right. one-time payment, right. that they have reached this six-year licensing agreement as well as a multi-year chipset supply agreement. Can yeah. you tell us more? I mean, what is the amount of this payment? Right. The only clue we have so far is that Qualcomm said this will be worth $2 in EPS for them on an annual basis. The analysts and the investors I spoke to said, look, you know, using this assumption, that assumption, if you back that out, it looks like Apple has agreed to pay roughly the same licensing percentage that everybody else has to pay. If that's the case, this is a victory for Qualcomm. So can you put that into billions for me? <laughs> well, I'm the, asking the, you to do math on yeah, the spot. We'll put it this way. On, on an annual basis, Qualcomm is earning roughly $2 a share, so, sorry, $4 a share in EPS, so this is adding 50% to that, so that's a lot of money. So, Mark, does this seem to be Apple waving the white flag, Apple giving in? You know, I think it, not really Apple waving the white flag and Apple giving in, but more so Apple putting the consumer and its flagship product ahead of litigation. Now, this seems to be an extremely important fight for Tim Cook personally. And, you know, Apple as a whole going after Qualcomm for what they believe to be, you know, overcharging or double dipping, as they've been calling it uh, all morning. But more so now they're saying, hey, we realize we need to be in 5G. This is more of an admission of Apple saying they, they don't think Intel is capable of giving them the 5G modems as early as the end of next year, as Intel and Apple had been anticipating for months now. It also means that Apple's own in-house chip efforts are likely, you know, ways off. That six-year agreement, I think, is going to become a moot point in three or four years when Apple will inevitably have its own modems ready.
Interesting. And Apple CEO Tim Cook and Qualcomm CEO Steve Mollenkopf were expected to testify in this, this particular trial, right. trial, which really upped the ante, Ian. Yeah. But does this agreement means, mean the core issues go away? I mean, Apple is complaining that Qualcomm is charging too much, abusing its market dominance. Yeah. Qualcomm is saying, look, these are the rules. We own these patents, and sorry, you have to pay. Yeah. That's not going to change. I mean, there's, there's a couple of factors at play here. You'll remember that there was an FTC trial basically accusing Qualcomm of the practices that you just mentioned that that we still don't have a result in there we still have to see how that will play out but fundamentally this is you know you've got technology and you've got licensing Qualcomm has pretty much throughout its history faced a series of legal challenges um, trying to get those license fees reduced it's managed to by and large to fend them off of course we're likely to see more of course as companies come and go in terms of the power of, of, of their customer base they're going to try to challenge this because it helps their profits now mark you had reported that apple had postponed 5g this year would perhaps consider it next year does this mean that apple could bring 5g even sooner i mean could it be in, in the, the phones that are unveiled as we expect them to be in the fall it's it's too late for Apple, you know, bearing some miracle of engineering. Uh, I don't see there being a chance that Apple has a 5G device out on the market this year. But what this does do is give them a much cleaner and clearer path to getting it on the market in 2020 around their next September, October, November iPhone cycle, uh, the iPhone you know, 12 or whatever they, they choose to call it. There had been some concern of them being able to get the right amount of chips from Intel or the proper processing power for, for 5G from the Intel modems. Now that all goes out the window because you have the best in Qualcomm, the market leader in 5G components, now under an agreement for the next six years with Apple. Yeah, and you're nodding. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's technology decision. I mean, these things take about 18 months. You know, chip to make alone takes three months, never mind the qualification and the networks, never mind integrating it into your device, never mind writing the software. So it, it's not going to happen this year. Um, it can't, basically. There's just not enough time. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman and Ian King. Coming up later this month, consumers will finally be able to buy Samsung's foldable phone. We got a sneak peek. This is Bloomberg. It's one of Samsung's boldest devices to date. Earlier this year, the company unveiled the Galaxy Fold phone, that can be a phone or a tablet, with a price tag of nearly $2,000. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman got his hands on the device for a closer look. Remember about eight years ago when Samsung launched giant, expensive, high-end smartphones and there was a group of people that thought it was a gimmick? Well, Samsung is hoping that's going to happen again and also turn mainstream. That's the Galaxy Fold. This is a $2,000 foldable phone. You can run three applications at once. The user interface is fairly intuitive. It's not as consistent as I would like when flowing between the smaller screen outside the phone and the bigger 7.3-inch screen when you open it. But I have a feeling it's going to get better over time if Samsung continues to invest in this style of smartphone. When you open it up, it's basically a tablet. It's almost the size as an iPad mini, but it doesn't really have large bezels all around it. It has an in-screen fingerprint scanner like the latest phones. There's a 5G version coming for international markets. This one goes on sale at the end of April in the US on AT&T and T-Mobile. Comes in several colors, including this blue and gold color. There's a silver, there's a dark gray slash black color. Uh, there's a green color that almost looks gold. Uh, overall, Productivity users and business users are probably going to like this thing for the multitasking. You're able to pin three applications next to each other at once. So, for example, you could be watching a video while also looking through your calendar and taking notes. So, overall, it's going to appeal to those types of users. But the $2,000 question is, are people really going to want to buy these things so soon after they hit the market, given the technology is still fairly early? I'm Mark Ehrman for Bloomberg News in New York. Coming up, Netflix's forecast for new user growth trails estimates, what it means for competitors like Disney, next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Netflix reports its first quarter results. The last quarter was relatively strong, and the streaming platform added the most customers ever, 9.6 million of them. But the forecast for the second quarter was underwhelming. Netflix said it would add 5 million customers, short of the more than 6 million that analysts had forecast. Netflix says price increases in the U.S., Brazil, Mexico, and parts of Europe will slow subscriber growth for a brief period but won't affect growth in the long run. But what about the competition it might see from Apple and Disney? Marianne Montaigne, portfolio manager at Gradient Investments and True Optics CEO Andre Swanston joined us with their reaction on Tuesday. I think I may come off as very contrarian, but I almost didn't care what Netflix uh, reported in terms of Q1 and, and their guidance for Q2, I think, is somewhat irrelevant as well in terms of the long-term um, outlook. Uh, really, I think Netflix is facing huge headwinds when, you know, Apple Plus and Disney Plus, uh, as well as all the, the, the massive growth that we're seeing across free ad-supported over-the-top and connected TV solutions come in. So I, I think Q4 of this year is when, you know, they'll for the first time truly have real direct head-to-head -head competition. And I, and I think it's going to be a, a challenge for them. Marion, you're an investor in Netflix. Do you care? <laughs> yeah, I care. And the way I see it is you're going to have some competition from Apple, but we really don't know what it is. What they told us was very, very slim. And when it comes to Disney, I think that they can coexist with Netflix. I don't think the parents are going to be watching Disney after 830 at night. That's just not the history of computers in general and uh, cable TV in particular. So those two together would still be under $20 a month. And I think that's something that they can very much coexist with. So uh, I sat down with Bob Iger, uh, the CEO of Disney, when they unveiled Disney Plus, and he talked about why he thinks the details of this service will be competition for Netflix and all the rest. Take a listen. Making them available uh, on a new technology platform, on a technology platform that is simply more modern and I think growing in popularity at a price that makes sense with a user interface that's beautiful, I think that's why we feel confident. So he's talking about the entire Disney vault, animated classics going back decades as well as uh, new original content. Andre, do you think customers are going to pay for that and Netflix? Uh, I think, you know, people like me that could, you know, don't even look at their bill can when it comes to that. But there's a lot of Americans that 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 can't afford to and will prioritize. I think some of the things that, you know, if we look at this as just kind of common sense, you know, in what business could you of any, of any industry? Could you lose your best selling product or some of your most valuable products to the, the business right next to you? And then they undercut you on price and it doesn't impact you. Um, I think the other thing that a lot of people aren't realizing is that the real growth over connect to TV over the last 24 months has been in ad supported solutions like Pluto TV and Zumo and others. And what Netflix benefited from for years was kind of being the de facto standard across over the top and connected TV. If you bought a new smart TV or you bought a Roku or you bought a, a Fire Stick, you had to get Netflix or else what was the purpose of having that device? But now what people are seeing um, across you know, 30, 35, 40 million homes is you, you buy those new devices and you turn on something free with ads. And then you can be very selective about how you add on top of that. And for any home, you know, that has a child, if you're prioritizing budget, do you prioritize Disney's whole uh, content library or, or the content that Netflix has? Um, and it's not really just children. It's the, the, the Avengers library and all the other things, um, as well as competition coming from Warner and then Apple. There's just so much. Net Netflix has never had to face so much direct competition. And where people are lowering prices, they're going to be increasing them. It's just, I, I, you know, I, I just can't find a metric by which it's not a concern. Disney's got the Star Wars library going for it as well. That said, Netflix yep. is, you know, it's got first mover advantage. Marianne, are you concerned about the forecast here? The price increase is slowing subscri subscriber growth at the same time that for the first time ever there could be real direct competition. 
Uh, actually, I would say now is a great time to be raising prices because the unemployment rate is so low, the participation rate is so high, the uh, wage growth is improving, and if you're going to take a price increase, now's the time to take it. And if it's a dollar or two a month, I don't think that's going to crush anybody's budget. And as I look out at the Netflix situation, they're growing very strongly overseas. They leverage the heck out of their content by dubbing or subtitles back and forth. So now things made in India will be shown here, either subtitles or, or dubbed. And I think there's just a ton of leverage to be had out of the system. So we're very positive on Netflix. So how do you explain what happened with the stock today? I mean, shares plunged 9% right after the results, and now they've stabilized. What happened there? Well, you're asking me? Yep. All right. Uh, what happened is people did not read through, and one of the things they did not read through was they beat on subscribers in both the U.S. and overseas. And when you look at that, uh, guidance for the coming quarter of five million, that is uh, right in line with the consensus numbers that we've seen. So it didn't knock the cover off the ball, but it was in line. I think people, too, have to think back to the management guidance in recent years, which has been conservative. They now have that, um, you know, common, more common attitude of we're going to guide down and then we're going to beat. And this has uh, been more frequent uh, in their situation. So we expect them to beat next quarter as well. Andre, Netflix is surely competing with companies with, with big budgets. Of course, Apple has $250 billion in cash, but you know they're investing multi-billions of dollars in original content over the next few years. Can they spend their way ahead of the competition? I mean, you know, Netflix has, has had a huge head start in terms of investing heavily in content. Um, I, I think more so they're not going to spend their way out of this because you can't spend more than these other companies if they decide that they really want to dig in as well. Um, I think there are some opportunities that Netflix could take advantage of uh, because they've been spending billions and billions of dollars for several years now. Uh, some of that content that's older, they could make ad supported. Uh, a lot of people have talked about that happening. I think that, um, you know, that's more of a reality going into 2020. If, if I if I were them. Um, I, I, I do think that that is a way they may go, but I, I think people are underestimating um they're overestimating the loyalty that people have to Netflix or any or any content in, in particular. Um, their the churn rate is much higher across households that don't have a, a child uh, across any OTT subscription service than ones that don't. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that I think would be concerning, regardless of what their their numbers are for for Q1 or Q2. Marianne Montaigne of Gradient Investments and True Optic CEO Andre Swanston. Well, the billionaire founder of the company that assembles Apple's iPhone plans to run for president of Taiwan. Foxconn's Terry Guo will seek the nomination of the opposition Kuomintang party. He says that a mythical Chinese sea goddess encouraged him to come forward to support peace with China. Coming up, can the HR industry be transformed by cloud-based services? One startup is betting on it. We'll speak with the CEO of Namely next. This is Bloomberg. Google and Apple have complied with an Indian court order to block downloads of the popular app TikTok. This after the government voiced concerns with illicit content on the app. This move could handicap its owner, China's ByteDance, in one of the most promising markets. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Tech's Mark Bergen, who has been reporting on this story. So interesting that the Indian government has intervened here, whereas other governments have not, in an app that's been concerning to a lot of people because, you know, you've got a lot of children on this app performing, lip syncing, um, and concerns about sexual predators. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting on multiple levels. Uh, in, in many ways, we've seen this, and we've done some great reporting out of Asia, that India, like other countries in Asia, are adopting more of a Chinese model of regulating the Internet. Mm. Um, so they're becoming a little bit more severe. Some would call it draconian. Um, and they're going after India, does have a fairly conservative-leaning politicians. And so they're going after a Chinese company right now who has made this big push 
They claim to have 120 million monthly active users. They've just grown and gangbusters. And, and one of the few tech companies in China that's actually done pretty well outside of China. They have a huge and growing presence here in the US. Uh, and, and they also, like this is an AI company that sort of prides itself on its ability to take down content pretty quickly. ByteDance has said the case is still ongoing to date. We have faith in the Indian judicial system and we're optimistic about an outcome that would be well received by over 120 million monthly active users in India. I mean, the concerns are really disturbing. Concerns about dangers to children, claims about porn, exposure to sexual predators. How is this different than what you might see on YouTube, where a parent can upload a video of their child and, you know, who knows what happens to it? Yeah, well, YouTube will tell you that no kid under 13 watches the videos uh, according to their terms of service. Uh, so, you know, there's right now Musical.ly, which was the app that uh, became TikTok, was, had a record fine from the FTC uh, around collection of, of, of children's privacy concerns. So there is a, a bit of a drumbeat and the same sort of advocacy groups are asking um, for lawmakers to, to look at YouTube in a similar way. Um, I also want to ask you about the Notre Dame situation. Obviously, a devastating story watching Notre Dame, you know, getting essentially burned out. And in the middle of that, on YouTube, this text box pops up that labels the burning of Notre Dame as 9 11. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, um, YouTube's just said that was, they said it was an algorithmic um, wrong call. Uh, which is interesting <laughs> phrasing, but I think you know I, what best we can uh, decipher. This is their image recognition technology that saw a picture of a burning facade and and, and sort of the, the software determined that it looked like a, an image of 9/11. Uh, and so there this could is something be lots that, of burning facades. Totally, I think. I mean, I think you know, there's a lot of cases where where YouTube over the years, the past few years, you have has been hammered for uh, pushing conspiracy theories like 9/11 was an inside job. And so in this case, this is a precaution they're taking. Um, I think it goes back to the point here. With, with TikTok too, ByteDance is this Chinese company that's prided itself on its artificial intelligence. Google is arguably the world's leading AI company. AI is not quite there at perfect at solving this problem. Um, and both companies will point to their scale as saying they can't have humans look at this. Um, YouTube has now said this morning, 500 hours uploaded a minute. And so even if you, know, if you had humans looking at that, this is clearly an interesting case where it's a breaking news event. You'd think that someone in the company would say, let's look at all the videos around the Notre Dame. Um, fire, because this is where a lot of people will be drawing attention, um, but they're still relying on, on machines and, and software right now. Right, and it's having to find that balance between what machines can do and what humans can and should do. Okay, Mark Bergen, who covers YouTube for us, thank you so much for that update. Elon Musk's SpaceX has won a NASA contract to play a real-life version of the arcade game Asteroids. SpaceX will provide launch services for the double asteroid redirection test mission. The goal? To demonstrate the ability to deflect an asteroid by crashing a spacecraft into one at high speed. The test mission is targeted for a June 2021 launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Well, for many that run an office, HR operations remain one of the biggest headaches in the workplace. But can tech streamline how the HR industry works? Namely, thinks so, and offers a cloud-based platform for small to mid-sized businesses. The company says 75% of their clients say Namely has increased employee engagement, and 72% say the platform has made its employees more productive. Namely CEO Elisa Steele joined us on Monday. Well, our software is so different because it's a full solution for a mid-sized company. Mid-sized companies have very small HR departments, but they have the same problems as a big enterprise. They have to manage their workforce, they have to drive employee engagement, they have to understand data and insights, and Namely puts that all together in a one-stop shop in a really easy package for them to understand and use. At the same time, we provide a really engaging platform directly for the employees. So are you competing with folks like Zenefits, Gusto, Workday, or are you competing with old school HR? Yeah, th those companies do similar things, but target on different customers. We're really targeted on that mid-sized com company, about 100 to 1,000 employees who are trying to manage that full suite. So usually it's a competitive situation of they haven't really adopted tech yet, and they have this opportunity to now modernize the workforce. Now, you know, what's interesting about HR is that you are at a sort of critical uh, entry point where employees are coming into the organization. You're also managing employees throughout the organization. And as we talk about issues of sort of bias in 
the corporate world in general, HR can play a critical role as well as technology that HR representatives use. Is that something that you're thinking about? Yeah, it's actually one of our newest and most popular products with our customer where we provide data and insights to help them understand their workforce and benchmark that against all of our other clients so that they understand how are we faring? How are we faring on pay equity? How are we faring on diversity? How are we doing in promotional opportunities for our people? And they can look at that in the context of Namely data and give themselves a scorecard. Talk to us about some of the big, biggest hurdles when it comes to modernizing HR and you know creating an HR workforce for sort of the modern world. Well, typically HR has been in a function that hasn't been able to be measured very well. And, and often it's not prioritized. And, and true in mid-sized companies. They usually have a department of one, maybe two if they're lucky. Mm. But like I said, they have the same problems as a big enterprise. They're trying to manage a workforce, drive engagement, retain their talent, attract talent. So having a solution that combines technology and the human beings of talent is really, really important for their success. So. I have to ask, you stepped into this role a few months ago, you'd just done a massive funding round, the CEO was apparently pushed out after an investigation that showed inconsistent that was showed actions inconsistent with what is expected of Namely leadership. What can you tell us about what happened there? Well, Namely is a very strong cultural value system. And when we have any employee that has a behavior that doesn't align with that, it, they don't really have a place at the company. And unfortunately, that happened with our CEO. And I, I was on the board at the time and stepped in, fell in love with the company, the product, and our customers. And I'm happy to say that I'm there now as the CEO. That was Elisa Steele, CEO of Namely. Still ahead, digital health company Everly Well wants to put health tests in the hands of consumers. How it is competing with the likes of 23andMe and other direct-to-consumer health startups. Next, this is Bloomberg. In the last year, Americans borrowed an estimated $88 billion to pay for health care, with one in four skipping treatment due to cost. That is according to a study by Gallup and West Health. Home lab startup, meantime, Everly Well wants to democratize the system. Everly Well offers a suite of at-home lab kits with over 35 panels, including tests for fertility, food sensitivity, and STDs. Since 2015, it shipped over 275,000 kits, and now the company has secured $50 million in new funding to expand its digital platform. Everly Well founder and CEO Julia Cheek joined us Tuesday to discuss. Everly Well is transforming the $25 billion lab testing industry, and the kits themselves are actually a way to make the process more accessible and convenient for consumers. So we actually work with fully certified, regulated labs that have been around for a long time, working with physicians and hospitals, and are simply using existing technology to be able to make a service that is suitable for home kit collection by a consumer, and then mailed off and resulted in a certified lab. Talk to us a little bit about the technology here and how proven it is. I mean, any time you say, you know, at home testing kit, that's, you know, can, can raise some alarm bells when you're doing something outside the doctor's office. How proven is the technology that you're using? I think what's important here is that Everly Well is the connector. We are not inventing any new lab testing technology or assays, and all of the labs that we work with pre-exist our company and have been in business for years or even decades. And so what we are making easier is the home collection process of a sample um, using materials that have been validated and are cleared for use via various federal and state regulatory bodies. So the testing itself is just as accurate as the the same test that your doctors and physicians typically use. And in fact, we work um, both with an independent physician network to review the orders and the results, as well as work with physicians around the country that our consumers share their results with. So as I understand it, your tests aren't FDA approved. And so some of the critics say this is a way to get around FDA approval. How do you respond to that? So laboratory testing in the United States is regulated by two federal bodies, the FDA, as well as the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, otherwise known as CMS. CMS is the regulatory body that currently regulates the tests that Everly Well offers through our network of labs. Um, that is generally through um, a, a 
a body of legislation called CLIA. All of the labs that we work with meet and exceed federal regulations for lab testing, um, as well as meet or exceed the state-by-state -state regulations. So should the FDA choose to um, regulate our type of lab testing, we would love and, and be excited to engage with them on that. So how do you help people understand what the test results show, whether they really have a food sensitivity or maybe it's a sign of something more severe like cancer or maybe it's an eating disorder? I mean, can the test really tell you that at home? I think what's important here is that we are making it very accessible for consumers to get accurate, insightful, and clear lab results. These results are not only reviewed by independent board certified physicians, but then are also available and encouraged to be shared with consumers' primary care physicians. In fact, 80% of our customers have a primary care physician and 60% report using these results directly with their physicians. And so the goal is really to provide a service that closes the care gap of consumer compliance around lab testing. Something like 40% of Americans don't get testing done due to a fear of cost. Um, and so our goal is to be able to increase that rate of getting testing done so that it's a useful experience for people. And then they can work in conjunction with their healthcare provider as well as with their own lifestyle and wellness plans to improve their health. Now, I'm sure whether you like it or not, you're compared to Theranos all the time. I realize they were creating technology and, and, and you are not creating lab testing technology. However, the sort of spectacular failure of Theranos is very fresh in the health tech industry. You know, what can you say to, to assure consumers and, and your customers that you know, everything that you're providing them is sound. The most important point to know about the Everlywell brand is the network of labs that we partner with work already with physicians and hospitals. They existed before we had this digital model to be able to allow consumers to initiate test orders. And so they are relied upon by many of the top physician networks and hospitals in the country. And we also work with some of the larger labs in the country as well. And obviously there have been uh, parallels made, but I think the most important point is that we are really connecting people to proven technology, similar to what a Warby Parker model did, which is connecting people to more affordable eyeglasses and, and a physician prescription service and not creating anything new. Everly Well CEO and founder Julia Cheek there. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. You can tune in every day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And we're live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.